So Matt, I know you're like stand-up comedy. You're the funny man of mathematics, but you are allowed to be serious today. I want to get, you know, I want to see what's inside your heart. I'm looking forward to the opportunity. I want the tears of a clown. Behind the happy face is always, actually, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm fine, actually. If we end up with tears, I feel like in some ways I will have done my job really well, but in other ways it will have gone catastrophically. I will feel slightly bullied. <laughs> <I know. laughs> All right, we'll see where we end up on that front. Matt Parker will be familiar to most people who watch number file videos. Today we're going to look at the fact that all prime the rules numbers, are you square them, you're allowed to add numbers together, you're allowed to subtract numbers, numbers because, because you're allowed for some reason radio is printed out. The first one million digits of pi. He's already beaten about 50 of them, and there are more on the way. And to borrow a cliche, it'd be fair to describe Matt as one of the busiest people in mathematical show business. He regularly performs to sell out shows. He broadcasts across the full range of media, and more recently, he started writing books. All of his endeavors combine a unique blend of genuinely funny comedy with an equally genuine passion for proper, real deal mathematics. How do you explain your job to a stranger or a taxi driver or someone like, when you meet someone who has no idea what you're doing, they say, hey, mate, what do you do for a living? That's a really good question because there is no concise way of doing it. And when I'm at my happiest is when someone asks my wife what I do for a living. Yeah. Often if I'm nearby, I'm like, all right, let's hear this. This could be interesting. Actually, it happened because when we got married, we had to do an interview to prove it was legitimate marriage because I wasn't British. And one of the questions in the interview process to check that you're a real couple, they turned to Lucy and said, so uh, describe Matt's job. And I was like, can't wait to hear this. <laughs> Go for it. And so you're in the room. They don't put you in separate rooms well, for this they're, interrogation. They're meant to, they can. At their discretion, they can put you in separate rooms. On our case, they're like, look, there's just one of us here. Would you mind? being yeah. in the room i think we had we, we were not a high risk case right? so it was like mr and mrs it was like life. mr and mrs but the prize is being allowed to get married right. and so she's a solar physicist boom there's my answer for her she just said uh math teacher which is correct and i think that's what was written on my form and to be honest that's the answer i give so if a taxi driver or someone says what do you do for a living i just say I'm a math teacher because there are then very few follow on questions. And if you say, <laughs> I'm a stand up comedian, never say that because they always want you to tell a joke. Right? Yeah. And I'm not doing that. And if you say YouTuber, they're like, oh, and they've got some opinion or thing they want to go on about that. What do you say? Do you say you make YouTube videos or? Yeah, I say I make YouTube videos and usually they'll say, about what and I'll say kind of geeky stuff like science and maths and then they shut up. Oh, okay. So it's it's one further step to get to Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. Were you disappointed when your wife said he's a maths teacher? Did you want her no. to go into this proud spiel about all your success and fans? No, and no, very happy to just go with maths teacher. And that's what I always say. And it will tend to be if it's like a party scenario, and I say maths teacher. It'll be people I know or my wife who then says he's underselling what he does. He also blah, 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 blah. Actually, the most common place I get asked is going into the United States in immigration. They're like, so what, what do you do, sir? And so I tend to say math teacher or math teacher. But the problem is then they're like, oh, isn't school in at the moment? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, but I work part time for a university and I do this and I do that and the other. Now I think I'm just going to start saying author. And they're not going to ask me, oh, quick, write a chapter, right? Then, oh, But they're also not going to have too many follow-on questions other than, oh, what sort of author? And then I'll say, maths books. And then, you know, <laughs> there's no follow-on <laughs> questions. <it. laughs> so, done. All roads lead to, ah, uh, maths, huh? And then that's, that's like the it, ultimate yeah. conversational dead end. It really is. <laughs> Let's go to your beginnings because at last I'm interviewing someone who is from the great nation that I am from of Australia. Glorious sunburnt land. You were born in Australia. I was born in Perth, Western Australia. Okay. So you're from Adelaide, yes. which is lovely. Thank you. It's got a great mall. <laughs> Do you know the mall's balls got vandalized the other what? day? What? Really? There's this sculpture of these two giant silver balls 
in Rundle Mall and Adelaide. You Col- could tell my brain was there thinking, should I reference the mall's balls or not? Ah, yeah. Really, someone's vandalized Someone them. Someone went and graffitied them. He's like a pariah in Adelaide now. <sighs> anyway, sorry, we we, we, uh, we digress. Okay. So you're from Perth, which I'm from is Perth. a long way from Adelaide. A long way from Adelaide. I once drove from Perth to Adelaide. Hmm. In fact, we drove from Perth to Melbourne. I was going to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Wow. And I'd already done the Adelaide Fringe and then went to Perth to see the family because my mum gets very upset because my mum and dad still live in Perth. Yeah. And I go to Australia quite a bit for work, but it tends to be Sydney, Melbourne, occasionally Adelaide. And my mum gets a bit emotional if I literally fly over her without visiting, right? So yeah. every trip I go to Perth, which is great. I see family and hang out. And then Lucy and I hired a camper van and drove from Perth to Melbourne, which took eight and a half days. And it's a good, I think it was like it must have been four or five days before we even got to Adelaide, which is the nearest yeah. city, right? It's the first it, stop. <laughs> they've had to say it's the first stop. We're like, well, that's like day five. So you drove across the Nullarbor Plains. We plane. did the Nullarbor Plains. And actually, we stopped every megameter. So every 1,000 kilometers, the whole trip was 3.6 megameters. We got out of the car and took a photo because Lucy's research, she's a solar physicist, her research, everything's done in megameters, like 10 to the 6 meters. That's just what she uses. But on the sun, like that's tiny. And we actually paced out just over 3 megameters. And I wanted to show Lucy because she's British, just the size of Australia. And growing up in Perth, it's very isolated which has pros and cons. And the scale, until you drive it, it's such an abstract concept, the distances involved. And so we're like, right, we are going to drive across the Nullarbor. We're going to see the fact that there's one bit that's dead straight for 90 miles. And then it's the same scenery day after day. And we got to one service station, which had a motel made out of shipping crates attached to it. And Lucy's like, oh, this isn't, it's not very nice. I was like, do you want to drive to the next one? She's like, yep. So we got back in the car. Two hours later, another service station with a few shipping crates turned into a motel. And we're like, well, this is just what you get, right? This is the Nullarbor. Nullarbor, of course, means no trees. No trees. trees. Yeah, exactly. And there are no trees. That is not false advertising. There's a null null number of trees across the Nullarbor, which I love. So like yourself, I've lived in the UK now for, goodness, I've done like a decade and a half Hmm. now. So, you know, I've obviously got a love for Britain and the British people. Do you consider yourself an Australian or a Brit? You know, I consider myself Australian. Yeah. And that's difficult having a British accent. So... You think you have a British accent? I, do, I definitely have a British accent. Well, it's so, straight. So If so, you have a British accent, what have I got? Well, you're definitely more Australian than... You, I think you've got a better Aussie accent than me. You think I sound more Australian I than you? I think you sound more Australian I than think me. the exact opposite. Really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, anyway, because we we were in Kalgoorlie, which is this mining town where the um, paternal side of my family comes from Kalgoorlie. Yeah. And so Lucy and I have actually been there a couple times. We really like Kalgoorlie. It's like this Wild West mining town. It's terrible, but mm. we love it. And it's where the Halfords, who uh, my paternal grandmother's line came from. Mm. And we got there and we'd missed when the hotel we'd booked had closed. Because like, it's a long time to get there and we just took a bit too long. And when it's closed, it's closed, right? We had no, And we bumped into someone else staying in that hotel. And we were like, oh, we just missed them closing. And now we can't get in until tomorrow. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, it's a lot. They, were, they were talking about Kalgoorlie. And I was like, oh, actually, Lucy said, oh, Matt's actually from Perth. And they were like, what? And I said, yeah, my accent's changed a lot. And they just looked at me and went, ah, oh, that's a shocker. Now, whenever I talk, occasionally Lucy will go, oh, that's a shocker. Because uh, just my accent to Australians is super British. Yeah. But to British people, I still sound very Australian. And to Australians who live abroad, I fall into a spectrum. So some of my, I still do weird things to some vowels. That's between you and the vowels, man. <laughs> exactly. And some inflections here and there and, and certain words and phrases and even weird things like, is it gotten? There's a few words that I would use all the time. And then people are like, oh, that's a weird way to say that. So as a boy in Perth, when you did still have an Australian accent, were you a math kid straight away? Was it was the writing on the wall? I was nerdy right out of the gates. So obviously I played a bit of sport because in Australia, everyone's forced to play every sport just to make sure you're not good at any of them. That was eliminated, was it? It really was. That's why Australia punches above its weight. Uh, in the, uh, My argument, international sport, is we just check every citizen. <laughs> Against every sport when they're in primary school, just to see if they're good at them or not, right? Were there any that you had any aptitude for? I, I could play basketball. 
And yeah. so I was on the high school basketball team and I love playing basketball and that was great. And height is a bit of an advantage and I could jump, right? And I thoroughly enjoyed basketball. Terrible at cricket. I was adequate at lacrosse. <laughs> I know. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. So yeah, give that a go. Uh, passed the ball at football and soccer and the rest, right? But I loved nerdy things. And so my dad is an accountant and my mum trained as a uh, dental assistant, but then basically has either worked in bookshops or libraries ever since. And so it's quite a nerdy family in that regard. Yeah. And when I was very young, my dad gave me exercise books to do, which were arithmetic. And I quite enjoyed that, right? It's one of my earlier memories is enjoying doing adding up, which, you know, that worked out. And I often say when I'm asked about my background that it was an advantage going to school already liking maths or already been convinced it's a fun thing to do. And I think that's very true that, you know, if you don't like maths, it's easy to get behind. And once you're behind, you're in big trouble. So the fact that it was at home and, you know, my rolling start, I always enjoyed it. I loved it, but I still enjoyed physics and chemistry. And when I was younger, a lot of biology bits and even like I was doing programming. There's a thing in Perth called PIAC, which I think still runs, which is Primary Extension and Challenge. And that's where they get a bunch of kids. They're like, hey, you look a bit bored in lessons. And you do a different thing in a different school once a term. And one time it was programming. And one time it was stop animation. And one time it was sampling bugs from a swamp over the course of a season or something, right? And that was a, such a wide range of nerdy things. And that's my first memories of programming and maths and, and chemistry and a bunch of other things. And I've been a poly nerd, I think, ever since. What would the answer have been when you know people were, and what do you want to be when you grow up? Like Once you sort of were old enough to have the concept mm. of a career in mind, what were you aiming at back then? Oh, my absolute first memory of what I wanted to be when I grew up was a bricklayer. Right. I liked building, people building buildings. Like, that's amazing. And then that gradually transformed into engineering when I realized just putting the bricks in place is probably not the most fun part, although I still enjoy, you know, construction and hands-on things. And so I actually studied engineering at university initially. Right. And this is just between us and all the uh, number file podcast listeners. Yeah. I initially enrolled in a mechatronic engineering degree. What does that mean? I which means you're doing mechanical engineering with electronics. Okay. Turns out I'm terrible at electrical engineering. Like I used to love soldering and I've, I've been soldering, you know, since primary school and I love electrical circuits. But that kind of electrical engineering, that hardcore analysis of circuits, I just didn't. I was like, oh, this isn't that exciting. And I really enjoyed civil engineering because we were forced to do some civil units. So love concrete, big fan of concrete, as I discovered in material engineering. And so I really enjoyed all this. But I did it as a double major. So I was doing a double major in mechatronic, which then became mechanical engineering and physics. First year, I did computer science as well because you're allowed to do an extra first year. And so I did first year comp sci, again, love that, but never pursued it beyond that. And I did two years of engineering and I was like, this is not for me. Right. And I'd done all the requirements for the first two years of a math degree while doing physics. And then I did an extra year on the end, which was the third year of maths. And so then I did my maths bachelor's. So I officially got a bachelor of science, double majoring in physics and mathematics. So for that first year or two, when you were like, gone more engineering -y and physics had you kind of put mathematics to one side for a bit had you like because the mat i know obviously is you know all about the mathematics you know it was there a year or two when that sort of subsided or not were you really it was always there and my educational career was just a gradual shedding of bits so if you spoke to me when i was in high school i probably wouldn't have been able to split maths physics and chemistry and by the end of high school, chemistry, I was like, I'm sick of memorizing the colors of things that precipitate out and salts and all these things. And then I loved physics. So I did a physics degree, absolutely loved it. But I was kind of just happiest when the equations were working out well. But I enjoyed it enough that I finished the degree and looked at doing postgraduate physics. But then I was like, actually, I really like loved the maths aspects. And so I was like, well... Let's do the math degrees. We're like, well, I'm not in a rush, right? I thoroughly enjoyed the equations doing physics. I enjoyed all the maths units. Let's do third year maths. I don't want to miss out on that. And what actually bumped me into hard maths, 
and I've still got a soft spot for physics, obviously, was after that, I did a teaching qualification. And I was like, what do I want to teach? What did I enjoy talking about the most? And it was maths. And so and then I did a maths teaching qualification afterwards. And that's what finally steered me into hardcore maths. And to this day, I kind of keep an eye on physics. And my brother's a physicist and my wife's a physicist. But since then, I've just got more and more into maths. And the fact that I can do it at a recreational level in kind of a way you can't do physics, I find um, amazing. What made you want to be a teacher? Why not be like, you know, a math researcher and prove the Riemann hypothesis or become like a university mathematician or, you know, make a yeah. million dollars in Wall Street? Like, why did you want to be a teacher? So the reason why I left studying was I was like, okay, I could go into do, you know, a PhD would be the next step. I wasn't a brilliant theoretical physicist. I quite enjoyed experimental stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, but I was so sick of, I'd done four years at that point. And I was like, oh, I just need a break from constant studying. But I had been tutoring high school students to make ends meet. I was like, oh, I really enjoyed doing that. I also fancied moving to the UK because I'd been to the UK for a gap year before I went to university. I was like, oh, I loved it in the UK. And no one should spend their whole life in Perth. Like, I love Perth. Everyone in Perth needs to live somewhere else for a year at least. And I'd done this gap year, but I did that when I was like 17. And I was like, you know what? As an adult, I'd like to go live in England again. And I was like, well, I don't want to just work in pubs. And so genuinely, my logic was I'll get a teaching qualification and then I can teach in England while traveling. That was my plan. But it wasn't just that because that's a lot of effort to go on vacation. I was also thinking, I wonder if I would enjoy this as a career. And this is a good way to find out. And the teaching qualification is one year. The um, Diploma of Education is a one-year postgraduate diploma. And you get to do a placement pretty quick. And I was like, well, I'm going to do my first placement within like four months. I'll find out very quickly if I enjoy teaching. And I absolutely loved it. I loved my placements. I loved the qualification. I then actually taught in Australia for a year first because I kind of thought, well, I'm enjoying this. I should do it my own culture first. And so I taught for one year in Perth, had a great time. But then I was like, you know, originally I wanted to go to the UK. And so I then went on the, I got the two year working holiday to the United Kingdom and off I went and taught some of the time, traveled some of the time, absolutely enjoyed it. And towards the end of that is when I started doing work for universities. And that's when I started to drift out of teaching. So I then moved on to a more permanent visa doing educational support stuff in the UK. Often when you speak to people who become teachers, they talk about those first months when they go into the classroom and often they're quite horrific stories like people like, I wasn't prepared for the stress and the amount of work, but you seem to be talking about it very fondly. Was it not jumping in the deep end? Oh, that's, no, get me wrong. It was incredibly difficult. So actually I spoke to a new teacher last night. They came to a talk I did, a physics teacher, and I often get asked for advice because people know I was a teacher. I always say your first year of teaching is the hardest year of your life. Oh, no, actually, depending on how your training is done, for me, my diploma of education was the hardest year of my life. My first year of teaching was the second hardest year of my life. It's There's no way to learn teaching than doing it. You learn a bit of theory, and then you've got to stand up in front of teenagers and convince them to listen to you. But it gets dramatically easier with experience because you see a student, your second or third year teaching, a student would do something stupid, and you're like, ah, I've dealt with this before, right? And you're so much better the second time. And once you've, when you first start, you're staying up until after midnight planning lessons because you're doing everything from scratch. But then second, third year in, you're like, oh, okay, I've taught this before. I've already got the resources. And a um, teacher I worked with, a guy called Kim Lee, when I was at my first year of teaching said, after five years, teaching becomes more of a hobby. And it's true. It starts as the hardest thing you'll ever do. And in five years, it's a hobby that you do on the side with the rest of your work-life balance. And I taught for four years, so I fell just short of that. But I miss it, right? It's really, it's super hard work, but it is very rewarding. Matt, obviously, a lot of your communication of math now that we'll come on to shortly involves comedy and humor. Mm -hmm. Were you like that as a teacher from day one? Were you Mr. Parker, the funny teacher? I who... was not. No. No. No, because comedy doesn't fly with teenagers. And the moment teenagers think you're trying to impress them, this is my motto, 
the moment they think you're trying to impress them, it's all over. And so I wasn't the funny teacher. Although I, you know, there's a certain amount of dry humor that gets you through dealing with teenagers, Hmm. which a few students that will resonate with. And you can spot the ones who've got, I would say, an advanced sense of humor, but obviously I'm biased. Right. And so that's kind of fun. Right. And I got endless entertainment from saying things which I knew the students would find hilarious but I do it with a straight face, right? And they can't tell, you know, they're like, mm, I can't believe you said that. And I'm like, I can't believe they didn't know I said that deliberately, which is good fun. But comedy is very different to teaching. When I was at uni, I did bits of comedy writing. I wrote for the student paper, the um, the Pelican at University of Western Australia. Oh, the Pelican. The oh. Pelican. Oh, anyway, yeah, yeah. That, that fine. <laughs> hey, it's no Adelaide advertiser, but it's, it's a decent Hang on a second. Hang on a second. You're now co-mingling <laughs> my important newspaper with like a student paper. Oh, I think they're all peers. <laughs> this is apples uh, and oranges here. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Didn't know one of us is a real journalist. Um, so. <laughs> but in university, you were into comedy. I was into like, comedy. I was into comedy, yes. Performing yes, yes. as well or just writing? Uh, just writing. And I did short films. Yeah. So this is before YouTube. So I made short films for short film festivals. Yeah. And then I had a spot on the community television station. So Channel 31. Oh. I was making little comedy videos. They weren't math or nerdy. They were just comedy skit kind of things. Like what's an example of one? What would happen? Oh, goodness. So we used to do a bunch of really surrealish stuff. So my absolute favorite, the one that I was just ideal... It's just a shot of a road in Perth with traffic driving along. And then I walk into frame from one side with a big roll under my arm and I roll out a zebra crossing across the road. And then the traffic all stops. And then I cross the zebra crossing and then I roll back up the cro- <laughs> and then walk off. Did you do that for real or was it set up? I did up? it for real. Did it genuinely you for real. did set up the drivers or anything? No, I, I was, I did things properly, right? And cool. I was just like, oh, it's so funny. All right. And it was that kind of weird not trigger happy TV or jackass, but something like weird s- skits, but filmed guerrilla style in yeah. locations. Yeah, yeah. But legal enough that we could put them on community television. Right. And so I used to love doing that, right? And so we used to write all these stupid films and uh, me and a friend of mine, we remade a video about drugs from the 60s entirely in finger puppets. So we did a complete re-edit of the audio and then refilmed it, did a remake with finger puppets, right? And we thought we were hilarious, yeah. ended it into a film festival, right? That kind of stuff. Yeah. And, but then all that went on hold when I went to teaching and it was a while into teaching when I, I was like, oh, I miss, like teaching is a creative outlet, don't get me wrong, but I missed that kind of comedy pure creative outlet so this is now when you're in the uk you're starting to get like the itch to do funny things again yeah so i did a little bit in that at the end of the year i would do a entertaining lesson for the students which wasn't on something they had to know so i did like you know i'm gonna do just a whole talk about pythagoras right and i'd put in some things that i thought were kind of funny teacher jokes yeah. Which math teacher jokes are a very specific genre. Yeah. But then I'd go, oh, do you want the students from the lesson next door would come in and do that. And one time when I was teaching in the UK, uh, the school I was at forgot to book. They were trying to book Simon Singh's Enigma school visits, which James Grime now does. Yeah. Right. But this is before James did. I knew James before he was doing that. And this is this was 2006. I think Claire Ellis was doing it at the time. And they forgot to book. Simon Singh's Enigma Machine, yeah. but we had all of Year Nine, and I was like, "I'll oh, give it a go. This is your moment. This is it. This is my time to shine. A right? star is born. I'll do a talk, all right? and that was it. And so I did a interesting maths talk for Year Nine. With how much preparation? How long out did they realize uh, this problem? A, a week or two. And do you remember what well, it was like about? Long enough. Yeah, I did a little bit about maths in The Simpsons, which now obviously Simon Singh has written a book about. So anyway. I replaced it with what would future be a Simon Singh topic. Uh, and I talked about some probability stuff. I did the birthday paradox, which is a classic of the genre. Was this a funny talk or was this a... It was an entertaining talk. Again, yeah. they're teenagers. And to this day, I still do big talks for teenagers. Something that's entertaining for teenagers is an unusual form of entertainment because they're teenagers and they have no life experience. And they don't like to think you're trying to impress them. But they do find things funny. And so you got to entertain them despite themselves, which I love doing. And so it was nearly a proto version of that. I wasn't cracking jokes, but I was doing entertaining things with the maths. Were people coming up to you saying, oh, Matt, you should 
turned professional no, or was it just your pure enjoyment of it, the it's my pure enjoyment of doing it myself i was like i love this i want to mm. do more of this mm. and then i did some work on a summer school at imperial college i helped in the branch which was teaching students programming and then occasionally there'd be some dead time like in the morning they'd come in there'd be like an hour before we got going and i was like ah i'll do a morning puzzle or a morning talk yeah. and i started filling in whenever there was a gap in the schedule, I'd do a bit of a talk. And I loved that. And that is what then made me think, hey, there could be a career doing this bit that I enjoy. The talking about maths, which the students don't have to know, but in an interesting way. So you sort of saw a market for it beyond students? Or were you thinking I could be going and talking to students? Or were you thinking, no, I could do this in pubs and in the venues? It was both. So also in 2006... With a um, another math teacher, a guy called Julian Smith, we filmed but never finished a YouTube video about similar triangles because we were like, "Hey, this YouTube thing just happened. That's exciting. Let's do some videos about maths." But we we're filming it on like DV tapes, and then we never got it finished because we were originally thinking it'd be useful for teachers to use in their classes. And at the same time, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to do the fun bit of teaching, but for adults? And so all of this was kind of happening at about the same time. And then I thought, you know what, if I want to be serious about doing these talks for students and doing them well, and if I'm serious about thinking maybe this would work for adults and possibly doing it in video and other forms, I need to get better at public speaking. Mm -hmm. And so I'd worked for Imperial for a while because after the summer schools, I stayed on and did some work with their outreach. And then I went back to teaching for a while. And when I went back to teaching, that's when I went right. I'm going to go back to teaching because that's a good, stable job while I work out how I'm going to do this dream job I want to do. And I realized I need public speaking training. But I looked up public speaking training and all the options are very corporate, how to give a business presentation, how to sell. And I was like, no, no, no I just want to be entertaining. And then I saw you could do a course in stand-up comedy. And I've got a very academic approach to life. And I was like, that's perfect. I'll do that. As an evening course, it was one evening a week for 10 weeks and you finish by doing like a show where everyone on the course does their bits and it was like fundamentals of stand-up comedy i was like brilliant i'll go in there get all those delicious transferable skills right and then apply them to math and i did i did the course but i loved it absolutely loved doing stand-up and so instead were of you already like incorporating math content into it or were you going along Completely as a guy who are, could be a comedian or anything. I started quite pure, but I still talked about being a mathematician. Right. And so the very first joke I told on stage was, it was a classic, hey, I just noticed if you go into Sainsbury's, you can buy a cake from their in-house bakery and they will print any photograph you want on the top of that cake. So I... Whenever I have to buy a cake to save money, I buy the cheapest cake they've got and get a photo of a really nice cake printed on the top, right? And that's, that's not a maths joke. It's probably not even technically a joke. <laughs> but that kind of self-referential humor, that, log that playing with logic, that became my shtick. It was, I'm a mathematician. I think the world should be logical. Here's some funny ways my logical view on life plays out. And here's when I get upset that reality is not as logical as I think it should be. And so I was a very nerdy character on stage, which was just me. But I didn't communicate any maths, but I talked about being a mathematician. That first gig you mentioned, tell me the story of that, because that must have been like your first teaching lesson as oh, well. It was so it was a special moment because it must have been two or three weeks into doing this stand-up course. And it was all very supportive. And you get up and the first week is just talk about yourself. And then we're gradually learning how to tell jokes and how to structure comedy. And a few of us were like, how hard can this be? Yeah. Really? Like, we're all killing it here, right? How hard can it be in the real world? And so I think four of us signed up for an open mic night. We're like, let's get out there in the real world. Let's see what it's really like. So we all signed up for this open mic night. And on the night... Only I showed up. <laughs> the others just the others just bailed, all of them. And I got there and no one else came along. I was like, you jerks. Did you have family or friends to help you? No one. Okay. So I walk into this pub where the comedy night was and everyone else is like, oh, I can't make it. Oh, I can't go anymore. Right? Everyone else dropped out. I was like, oh, for crying out loud. So 
I looked around the room. I said, those people over there look like they're also here for the comedy night. So I wandered over. Hey, are you guys here for the comedy night? They're like, oh, yeah, we're all, you know, new comedians. I was like, brilliant. You're my people. And, and there was, so, a, was there a big audience? And so I did it. Nah. It, so it was at a pub. One day there'd be a blue plaque there. It was a pub <laughs> in London. It was the Queen's Head just behind Piccadilly Circus. They don't do comedy there anymore. I, I was there the other day. <laughs> it was since I was, that night. I was like, they're like, hey, it can't get any better than this. Close the club down. Right? And so they had an open mic night. God, it was terrible. It was so terrible. Did it go well? Like, you'd, obviously, you're, you're... I had a great time. I had a great time. The problem was... What's difficult about open mic nights is it's very hard to get an audience. Mm. There's various ways to get around this. And the way this comedy night got around it is to get on stage, you had to bring audience members. Right. And the more audience members you brought, I kid you not, the longer you got on stage. Right. <laughs> and I brought roughly zero people. Okay. So they're like, nah, mate, you get two minutes at the end. Right. And so... Everyone else did their bits. And then they're like, and here's the jerk who didn't bring anyone. I'm like, hey, everyone. Right. And so I got up and did a two minute routine. And at the end of it, the audience enjoyed it enough. Well, I think they voted or something. I got to do an extra minute. Right? So <laughs> I got up to three minutes of stage time. Nice. Uh, but I loved it. And, and I got up and I did it. I mean, obviously, everyone's terrible when they start and it's terrifying, but I gave it a go and I enjoyed it. And people seem to enjoy it, right? And so that encouraged me. I was like, you know, I can do this, right? And, you know, carried on from there. Did you have a level of confidence and persistence that this was going to happen? Or do you think if that night and that had tanked and things had gone badly at the start, it might have all gone a different way? I would have persisted. There's a problem with stand-up in that you need to have a certain amount of self-delusion to persist despite all evidence to the contrary. That is sadly, that is a lower threshold. There's no upper bound. And so some people get into it because if you haven't got enough self-delusion, you won't persist. You'll give up. But if you've got too much and you never get any good, you just get stuck in this loop of doing terrible gigs. So thankfully, I, I was delusional enough or, you know, adamant enough or, you know, I, I'm a finisher complete. I was like, I'm going to do this. And so I think I would have definitely persisted. Because not everyone finished the course. People dropped out of doing even the stand-up course, which was quite a nice environment. I was like, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to do the final show. I'm going to do some open mic nights to give it a go. But I would have very quickly stopped doing it and just taken my transferable skills off to do something else if I hadn't got a good reaction reasonably quickly. Hmm. And thankfully, within a year, I was doing proper gigs. I think six months in, I got my first, still unpaid, but first actual booked spot to come and be a comedian on a show. And I think if I hadn't gotten that reasonably quickly, I would probably would have packed it in. Jumping forward a bit, you've now got, you know, Festival of Spoken Nerd and all the different things you do on YouTube and... <laughs> like you do a million different things and it's almost like this huge empire now was this the vision are you now living what you thought back then or were you thinking you'd just be like a comedian who goes to comedy clubs and maybe will one day get on tv or is what you're doing now what you were aiming for none of this is the plan right. um, but it is what i was aiming for so my original vision was just picturing i was like ah oh, wouldn't it be great if i could go to a pub and do a talk about maths and people would come along and watch it wouldn't that be incredible and with Festival of Spoken Nerd, that's now what we do, right? We've got our own night and evening of unnecessary detail in London and we tour around. I've done my own tours. And so I can still remember me as a teacher picturing this tiny pub with like me on the stage, like a flip chart or something, doing some interesting bits of maths, thinking, oh, wouldn't that be incredible? And that I've achieved. I didn't, everything else that's kind of grown up around it, and I do too many other things, have all just been me going, oh, wouldn't that be fun? So I kind of had a vague vision, but I never had a plan. How much are you driven by just like being a show off and wanting to be funny and make people laugh and the buzz that that gives you? And how much is there this kind of altruistic mathematics, the world must know the importance of, you know, which is driving you? It's probably 50-50. When I talk to university students or academics about outreach and I say, why do you do outreach? Why do you want people to know about your subjects? You tend to get the worthy answers of, oh, it's important, or I'm publicly funded, I should tell people, or, you know, a, a numerate and scientifically literate society is useful, which is all very true. But I'm also like, it can just be fun. And so I think it's pretty even. Maybe it's 60% fun, 40% useful, where I love performing, I love doing the shows, but 
I do make a rod for my own back by insisting that I put actual mass content in the shows. But it would be a bit hollow and pointless otherwise because comedy is great, but you make people laugh and then they walk away and that's it, right? And at the end of your life, what have you, I mean, you made some people laugh, which is wonderful, but then, you know, that's it. And I was like, no, I, the reason I got into teaching as well as enjoying it was I like seeing people enjoy it and I can do some good PR for mathematics and I can get more people into it and more people can enjoy their mass lives. And so I think it's a pretty even balance, particularly I still do a lot of shows for teenagers which I could easily not do, but I think that's super useful. Are you suggesting there are things, opportunities that you would not take because of this stand you're taking? Are there like things that have come to your head or have been offered to you that you've said no because you want me to dumb it down too much? Or? Sort of. I have don't do much TV, but that's because the stuff that comes up, I'm like, ugh. Right, and I never get offered the bits I want to do, and also TV's dead. But still, contact Matt's agent if you. But, but, uh, <laughs> Joe Wonder, Joe Wonder Management. Uh, yeah. but, but it's more that when I'm writing a comedy show, I would be disappointed in myself if I didn't put actual content into it. But I think that's a good challenge. Like right? constraints make the creative process more interesting, and I like that constraint. Yeah, I would be disappointed and not satisfied if I didn't do it. So I don't think it's so much me turning down opportunities. I'm probably inadvertently shutting off opportunities. Like the number of people who are in TV or whatever who've come to see a show and gone, yeah, but it will never work on TV. They're often a direct quote, and that's fine, right? Because they come and they look at that and they go, yeah, it's obviously for a niche audience. And I'm much more happy doing that. I mean, obviously, a fraction of a fraction of comedians go on to actually be successful in terms of TV. So I'm not saying, like, I turned down television, right? But I picked my niche, and I'm having a great time in it. And it was definitely could be seen as an astute career move to pick on one little demographic and do it well. But also, I think it's much more rewarding. You do perform live in front of pretty big audiences in the scheme of things. But obviously, those audiences aren't as big as, say the people who watch the YouTube videos no. that you're in. How do you compare the satisfaction or the thrill you get from doing like a live show with real human beings laughing out loud and you can smell them and you can hear them and that to a YouTube video you make that might have two or three million views? But It's surreal because I last year did a small bit on a show at the Royal Albert Hall. It was this big space extravaganza and a spoken nerd. We went out and did like a 10-minute bit in front of 5,000 people with Chris Hadfield, like absolutely phenomenal. Like, I was there. Like, I was you, there. Exactly. Peak of the career, right? And, uh, you know, you were you were one of those 5,000, you were a member of the five kilo people that were there. Yeah. But directly before that, I was like, oh, I've got to get this YouTube video I wanted to do out. I know. I'll zip over to Hyde Park, which is like the park just near there. And I'll quickly film it with the GoPro and I'll come back. And I can do an edit because our sound check was so early because we were like the least important people on the bill that I had a big block of time. So during that time, after the sound check, which was like, honestly, we were there at like eight in the morning. I then ran over to Hyde Park, filmed this thing on a GoPro, came back, uploaded it. And before I went on stage, it had had more than 5,000 views, like way more. And a bit of me is like, oh, I've just had, you know, like, 10 times the views on a thing I just banged out on a GoPro, which don't get me wrong, I love doing. But yet my focus is on this crazy going out in front of thousands of people. And you're right, it is different with a live audience. But then is that just because it's fun for me? Or is that because is it important to have live events? It's an interesting one. And I have a real fractal approach to mass communication. You need to have it at all different scales, like it's maths all the way down on every possible scale. So you want to have big live shows and small live shows and big videos and small videos and and because the level of engagement and the type of engagement is different. I personally would miss any one aspect if I didn't do it. Like you're right, the buzz you get off the live show is incredible. You don't get the same buzz from looking at a number on a YouTube count and go, oh. And then you try and you're like, what would three million people look like? And you're like, that's insane. Yeah. But they've watched some other video, then they watch the number file video, then they watch some other video. But also, rightly or wrongly, 
Like the stakes are higher for some reason in our heads when there are other living human beings in the same room as us. Isn't that crazy? Because I, I'll talk to people saying, can you help make a number file video for me? And they say, I can't possibly help you make a number file video. I've got to give a talk next week to 50 people and I have to spend a week preparing that talk. And part of me wants to say to them, are you insane? Are you like insane? if you do a video with me, a million people are going to watch. Have you and, run the numbers? Yeah, yeah. but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm exactly the same. If I was giving a talk to 50 people next week, it's all I'd be really thinking focused, about. Really yeah. focused, yeah. So it is... It's just our humanness, isn't it? So speaking of modes of communication, let's talk about books. You're just about to release your second? This is my second book. So the first one... Yep, Things to Make and Do in the Fourth Dimension. In which you misspelled my name. I do. I, only in one edition. Uh-huh. And I genuinely... You know what? I'm going to print you out the email where I sent in the acknowledgements because it was originally spelled correctly and they messed it up, which was very disappointing. Well, for that for that reason, we're going to talk very little about that book. We're going to move right on to the right, new one, to a book about mistakes. Because I figured, you know what? If I'm going to make mistakes, I'll do a whole book about it. And so actually just literally today, as you know, yes. I picked up the first copies ever printed. Hand and it so over. I'm going to ceremoniously hand across Humble Pie, A Comedy of Maths Errors by Matt Parker. You were the first person other than me to be given an actual final copy of this book. Let's have a bit of foley work then. Here's what the book. There it is. This what it sounds like. That's me opening the audio book's just that for 10 hours. I'm not just saying this, Matt. I honestly really like the look of this book. It's I, nice, isn't it? I like the cover. That is because I'm a bit of a plane aficionado and the, the front of the book is a plane. It's a bit of a plane with the, the wings around the wrong way. Yeah. So I did ask when they pitched this cover idea to me because with the design I came up to, it wasn't me. And I was like, that's great. I said, ah, but can it be a Boeing 787 or can it be like, because there are actual planes in the book. Can it be a, you know, a BAC 111? And they're like, nope. It's going to be this made up plane, or I don't know if it is an actual plane, because that's the image they had the rights to. But they did a really nice job with it. I absolutely love the design. It's a beautiful. Tell us what the book's about. It's just a lot of stories about maths mistakes, because I wanted to write a book about how maths is important for our modern society. Everything, finance, economics, medicine, engineering, you name it, it's based on maths. But the publishers are like, well, you've got to make it interesting. Why are people going to read a book about why math is useful. And I said, ah, what if I told it through stories of when it goes wrong? Because it's a great excuse to talk about the maths in the context of it went wrong this one time and normally it doesn't. They're like, ah, oh, people love reading stories about disasters. Go for it, right? And so that's how, because obviously there's a lot of people into maths who read stuff I write and watch the videos. And I was like, how can I hit a bigger audience? And so uh, a book of maths mistakes. And this was announced about when the Parker Square video came out. And everyone's like, that's clever marketing. I'm like, that's totally coincidental and i have put a lot of plane stories in there and no one dies so (laughs) the trouble is with disaster problems particularly engineering and medical ones people die and you can't for a so-called comedy book about maths i can't every second story can't be and then everybody dies so i've rationed the stories where everybody dies and none of the aviation stories involve any death Everyone survives in all the aviation. So if you're scared of flying, it's still a bit terrifying what happens, but it's always okay. You know, the first thing I want to do in this book. What, read it thoroughly from the beginning? I mean, that would be how... uh... Are you you checking the acknowledgements? Yes. Okay, oh, fair enough, fair enough. I do not expect to be acknowledged, but if I am, I'll be looking for spelling. I go through and I give everyone who contributed something or helped me fact check something or have enabled my career in some way, get a reference in there. Oh, you've done it. You're the last line. The Parker Square is thanks to Bradley Heron. <laughs> Consider this a sign of my appreciation. Mate, mate indeed. <laughs> it's just my little way of saying thanks, Brady, for the Parker Square and all you've done for me. You I, Bradleyed me. I Well, it, <laughs> it felt deeply appropriate as a sign of... Yeah. The sign of my uh, thanks. I'll tip my hat to that. I'll get it fixed in the, again, as tradition dictates. Ah. I'll get it fixed in future editions. So, this, so, so only the hardback. When it goes to paperback, I'll get it flipped over. So, so. people, I'm going to say this now because Matt has helped Number File so much over the years. I, I owe him so many favors because he's been in so many videos for me. If you buy a hardback edition, a Bradley edition, while they're available, and you ever cross paths with me, I will sign it as Bradley. That's very generous. Which is something you, I normally refuse to do that. You refuse to do that yeah. on the previous yeah. book. So if you ever come to me with a Humble Pie hardback edition by Matt Parker, 
Oh, signed Bradley, signed Bradley Harren 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 on the page. Wow. And it, if you buy the hardback through Mass Gear, I sign them all before they go out. Mm-hmm. So you can get a double signed. Double signed. You've got to hunt down Bradley afterwards. Uh, I also want to know if for your author picture in the paperback edition, you're going to... Loop. They didn't update it, so it's still me with hair. You have a lot of hair it's in that not picture. not my new streamlined look. I don't even recognize you in that I picture. I know. I looked at that and went, oh, look at that young, optimistic fella. That photo was taken in 2011. Wow. How terrifying is that? Look at that. Fresh face. But I was also quite pleased because in there I talk about the civilization mistake where Gandhi, as soon as you get nuclear weapons in the first civilization game, he started nuking everyone and that was a mistake in the code and i love there's loads of things on like rollover and calculation errors in code but in all future editions of civilization they kept that mistake in as a reference to the original error and so i thought i would keep the mistake in out of respect for the first genuine error there are many things i wanted to talk to you about and we haven't got time like so, you will come back and do another absolutely another, another podcast as, soon. As you know, I will show up and do a podcast or a video anytime you ask. Thank you very much because there, there genuinely is so much more I want to talk to you about. But there's one thing we have to talk about in this episode, and we've already mentioned it, but I know people are going to want to hear you talk about it, and that is the Parker Square. So, for people who don't watch Number Five videos, how would you give an executive summary of the Parker Square story and how it rose to fame? So, the Parker Square. You don't have to go into all the map. I'll link to the video. So you you can watch the video. Yeah. And I did this video, and my message from the video was give it a go. I just have a go in maths. And actually, that's something that comes out in the book. I'm like, everyone thinks maths is all about getting the right answer. It's not. Most doing of maths involves getting it wrong, getting it wrong, getting it wrong. So I had a go at finding this magic square. It wasn't that good. You called it the Parker Square. It was all very funny. Ah, oh, fine. Has it got a name? <laughs> that hasn't got a name. I don't want to call it the Parker Square because it doesn't work properly. Everyone would be like, oh, the, that's a what, classic Parker Square. Or someone would do something that's almost right, but not quite. And they go, that's a real Parker Square kind of move. So I'm not calling it the Parker Square. Matt, you know what this video is I'm calling it after crying out loud. <laughs> the first time you name something after me, is something that's not quite right. You know what? Maybe it'll become the mascot for giving things a go. And there was a wonderful moment. Do you remember after we stopped filming... And we were both just like, I was just like, I can't believe this has happened. And you looked at me and said, I cannot put the video out if you want. And I was like, it's fine. Uh, number one, it's funny. Yeah. And number two, I think it's an important message to give it a go. And you were like, you'll never hear the end of it. And I'm like, no, it's fine. <laughs> And no, you said, you'll never hear the end. Exactly. I'll make sure of it. Yeah, no, but then you said, I won't make a big deal of it. And I'm like, oh, good, 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 right? And then there was a range of T-shirts. <laughs> so I didn't fully know what I was agreeing to at the time. So I say it's a mascot for giving it a go. Other people say it's a mascot of when your best just isn't good enough. Yeah. So I think it falls somewhere on that spectrum. It's kind of starting to morph into a mascot for failure and getting things wrong rather than noble effort. But... Exactly, right? Yeah. So I keep trying to bring the noble effort back to the table and other actors, I mean, I, I don't want to point fingers, <laughs> seem to use it as a shorthand <laughs> for hilarious failure. How much does it, like, because obviously my exposure to your life is limited to... Number file. Yeah, and my, and yeah. so, so to me, the Parker Square and Matt Parker have become very, very closely entwined. And I can't upload a video with you without Parker Square jokes. And how much does it follow you around? Like, you know. A non trivial amount, Brady. Um, <laughs> like, you so, get t shirts. So gig- I get the t shirts. People show up wearing t shirts to gigs, which I love, right? And everyone who does, I then take a selfie with them. One where I'm like, hey, Parker Square. And one where I'm like, oh, Parker Square, right? And so they get, you know, I love doing that, right? That's really good fun. The fact that people wear the shirts is great. Because I sound a lot of calculators that's a common thing i do yeah and quite a few people ask me to sign their book or their calculator and draw a parker square into it so, so you've memorized it properly. I, I, yeah I, I, I keep thinking i should get it wrong each time <laughs> right and so i sign a lot of parker squares yeah it's a good go-to joke when i chat to someone because a lot of people will recognize me in the street and instinctively go oh hi and then they realize 
that they've done that without a plan, right? Because I appeared out of nowhere. They're just going about their shopping or whatever. They're on the train. Suddenly, someone from YouTube jumps in front of them and they're like, oh, hey, you're that guy. How are you doing? And then they're like, I've got no follow-on plan. Now I'm socializing with a human that I wasn't expecting to, all right? And so some people just are like, bye, and they run away again, which is also adorable. But some people are like, oh, hey, Parker Square, right? That's their kind of go-to. So um, yeah. for better or for worse, it follows me around, but in a very nice way. If you could go back in time, you can't, <laughs> but if you no. could go back in time, would you not do that video? Would you think, oh, it's just a bit of a... I would happily put it out. You know, I get the correct amount of annoyed, but I like the fact that people have embraced it as a meme kind of concept. And I like the fact that it, to some extent, reinforces the notion of giving it a go. The square is mentioned at the very end of the book because I knew some people would expect it to be in there. Yeah. And I hold off, hold off, hold off. It's only like in the final pages. And actually I've got a, um, there's a square of photos of people wearing Parker Square shirts at my shows, right? Which I thought would be kind of fun Here to, we put, go. to put in there at the end. So there's a Parker Square of Parker Squares. So minor spoiler, but if you do have the hard copy, which I hope you've all gone out and bought by now, you just have to flick to the back of the book to page nine. Page nine, yeah. Page nine, Page nine. Which, which is also a bit of a spoiler to the numbering system oh, in this book. <laughs> I, that took so many emails to Penguin, but they finally agreed to let me have a book with reverse number page numbers. There so we they go. go backwards. And there is, there indeed, there is a big montage of pictures of Matt with people wearing Parker Square t-shirts, which, uh, which yeah, I must have a little chat to uh, Penguin about royalties on that or something. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Again, my we pleasure. Might... I will be back for another podcast. We will finish off my life story. People, if you'd like to get your hands and eyes on a copy of Matt's book, the best way is via his website, Maths Gear, and I'll include a link in the notes for the show. That'll get you a copy signed by Matt, and it also means you'll get your hands on it, perhaps before the book is even officially released in your particular part of the world. More details in the notes. Go and have a look. My thanks also to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute for all its support of Number File and a double helping of thanks to Maya Sound. That's a Berkeley-based audio company which kindly made this particular episode possible. Again, links to them in the show notes. If you'd like to find out more about Numberphile, maybe even support us yourself, check out the links and all sorts of good stuff at numberphile.com. I'm Brady Harron, and I'll be back again soon with another episode of the Numberphile podcast. <laughs>